Hello, my name is Pedro Zapeda, and I'm a member of the Seminole Tribe of Florida. And I'm going to speak to you about wood carving among the Seminole Tribe and Southeastern Woodlands Tribes. It's something that we've done for generations, for thousands of years, and it's something that we still continue to do today. And all these items, these objects, they connect us to our past and they help us understand where we are today. The things that we carve from wood aren't simply objects. All these things that we make, they contain cultural knowledge that's been passed down through the generations. They have what I like to call cultural etiquette, different things that you learn about who can make certain objects, when they can make them, um, at what point in their lives do they learn to do certain things. We are a matrilineal clan system. So it means that we pass down our family and knowledge through the mother's side of the family. And with that, each clan will do things slightly different from one from another. And so the way one clan might do something might be slightly different from another clan. The reason I do these things is because I was taught by my grandma that it is important to maintain this knowledge. And in our traditional culture, we believe that all this knowledge was handed down by the creator, by the breath maker, and our way of honoring him is by maintaining the things that he's taught us to do. All these things that we make also, many of them are really important for day-to-day -day lives um, to help us survive. Dugout canoes are very important to Seminole people even today. We've always made dugout canoes. There's never been a time in our history where we have not made dugout canoes, and we continue to make them today. Although we don't use them in our day-to-day -day lives like we did 40, 50 years ago, it's still a direct connection to the land, to the water, to the earth, and helps, us rem helps remind us how important those connections are and how important it is to take care of our natural resources. So as a young Seminole boy, you start learning a lot of these skills at a very early age. Maybe when you're six, seven years old, you might get a small pocket knife and learn how to use that and uh, get a small hatchet and you start learning how to do simple carvings and you start learning how to help build homes and uh, our traditional thatched huts. And so all these skills are building upon things that you need to know in your day-to-day -day lives as a traditional Seminole. And so as you grow into your teen years, you build upon all those skills so you can survive on your own and help support any future family or, or your aunts and your uncles as well if they need a home repaired or built um, or if they need a spoon to cook over the fire. And here in Florida, canoes are so important because there are so many waterways and it's one of the best ways to travel around Florida. Even today, the waterways are still very important and vital. The Seminole canoe is very well designed for using in the Everglades and the open sawgrass that is in the environment down here. And so the pointed bow works very well in that open sawgrass. And the stern of the canoe can also be used if there's maybe a stronger current and it helps you control your canoe much better in the water young boys and young girls, men, women, they start learning how to use dugout canoes basically, you know, as soon as they can start uh, standing and walking and um, able to propel the canoes on their own and start learning that very early on and get very comfortable using dugout canoes. The main way we use dugout canoes is with a push pole. 
And so when the water is very shallow, we can use that push pole to propel us along through the water. When the water does get a little bit deeper, we can use a paddle. And it's also a very good way of moving these canoes. Although they seem very heavy, once the canoes get in the water, they become very light and nimble and agile. In the water. Because the water down in South Florida tends to be very shallow, usually not over six to 10 feet deep. And so using a push pole is one of the most efficient ways of getting around. Uh, and people still use push poles today. And so it has the, the blade here on the end of the push pole. Now this serves several purposes. Um, so it, one, it keeps you from getting stuck in the mud when you push it down all the way to the bottom of the water. Um, you can also use it as a paddle if the water does get a bit too deep or to, just to help control the boat. Um, so it does also kind of act as a rudder as well to help control the direction that the canoe will be going. And so the push pole can usually be about 12 to 18 feet long. It just depends on the waterway that you're in and where you're using the canoe the most. And so if it's deeper water, you have a little bit of a longer of a push pole. If it's more shallow water, you'll use a shorter push pole. Now, if you're somewhere where the water is very deep, then you can just switch to a paddle, um, which will work also very well. Usually we tend to stand either in the bow or the stern of the canoe. If it's stronger currents, we can use the stern of the canoe to you know, keep the canoe from going one direction or another. It's better in stronger currents. But in the sawgrass and the Everglades, this pointed bow works very well at um, pushing apart and cutting through the sawgrass down in the Everglades. So depending on where you're at, one end or the other canoe works very well for that. And so it can kind of handle any situation that you might need these canoes in. Something a lot of people don't realize is that Seminoles have been making and using sailing canoes for quite a number of years, probably several hundred years at least. And so this type of sail is called a sprit sail. It is very common among Seminoles. And we could sail across the Everglades or even as far as Cuba and the Bahamas, which was done historically in the 17 and 1800s. Even today, there's a group of Seminoles in the Bahamas on a place called Andros Island that sailed there during the Seminole Wars uh, to escape the, the fight and the battle here. And that community, community remains there today. Sailing is a very efficient way of, of getting around as long as you have fair winds and the sea's not too rough. Uh, you can make pretty good time using a, a sail, or you can even use it to supplement uh, using a push pole or paddling. Now people very often ask me, do I burn and scrape out these canoes? And no, I don't. You know, I use uh, modern steel tools and uh, antique steel tools. I use uh, even chainsaws and electric planers. Um, so I don't use any burning or scraping or stone or shell tools. Although there are historic accounts of that happening very early on. Uh, in the contact between natives and Europeans. Um, but that changed very shortly after Europeans arrived on this continent because they brought with them steel. And it was such a far superior material to the stone and shell that we were using before. Um, now those techniques of burning and scraping and using stone and shell tools do work, but it's much uh, more slow, is a bit more difficult to control um, how you're removing the wood. And so once we had access to steel tools, you kind of begin to see a, a difference in the way that our canoes are shaped and designed and styled. Um, and so there are uh, a few examples of those transition canoes when we were going from our uh, Stone Age technology to steel tools. So the process of making dugout canoes takes several months. And of course, first you have to find the correct tree. And so you want to find a large tree that's straight, has very few knots and branches, because um, you don't want those to get in the way as you're carving. And the tree that the Seminoles prefer to use is cypress. It's a very durable wood. It's resistant to rot and insects. Um, and those make it uh, really good for making a dugout canoe. The wood itself has a natural oil in it. It's called cypressine. And that oil is what gives it the, the resistance to rot and, and insects. Um, 
and these trees are very old as well. Um, so the tree in front of me, the canoe in front of me came from a tree that was probably around uh, 250 years old. So these are very old trees that um, I use. And I do look for trees that have fallen um, because of natural causes for things like a hurricane um, or storm. And then I find those trees and I'll pull them out because they're so um, good at resisting rot. The tree can lay in the woods for 10 years and I can still pull it out and it'll still be usable as a dugout canoe. Um, so once you find the correct tree, um, you know, I start actually by carving the outside of the canoe. And so I'll flatten the top and the sides and the bottom um, and shape the bow and the stern. And once I do that, then I'll begin the process of carving the inside of the canoe, digging it out. Um, hence the name dugout canoe. Now I do consider myself a modern canoe carver. Um, so with that, I'll use any of the tools available to me that really do the job best. Um, so when I'm starting out trying to remove a lot of the wood from flattening the top and the sides and the bottom, I'll use a lot of chainsaw and axe together to do a lot of that heavy wood removal. Um, once I get to the inside, I'm starting getting close to finishing the canoe, then I'll switch to using hand tools only. And so at that point, I'll use things like um, different hand adzes um, to really smooth out the canoe and uh, fit all those um, lovely curved shapes that are inside of a dugout canoe. Um, and so once you get the inside carved out, um, then you really want to just smooth out all the canoes, smooth out all the shapes. Then you can put it in the water and make sure that the canoe floats uh, level. And if it doesn't, then you can remove wood from one side or the other to make sure that the canoe floats just right in the water. Um, at that point, if you want to, you can put paint or oil or some sort of finish on it. Uh, and, and then you have a finished canoe. So the concept is very simple, but learning all the details and nuances does take time. Um, but to make a workable dugout canoe really isn't, you know, a super difficult task. But if you want to make a really fine one with good lines and uh, to be able to repeat the process, it just takes time and um, repetition and, and just that experience.
so as you can see, canoes really are an integral part of our history and our culture, something we've always done and something we still do today. And it really is my hope that canoes remain a part of our culture into the future as well. So growing up, my uh, grandmother was a big inspiration for me. Um, you know, I'd see her uh, sewing traditional patchwork clothing like I'm wearing right now. And she did that every day, and that's what she did as a living. And so you're, you know, cooking traditional food, and my uncles might bring a, uh, some turtles or a deer, and so and she would butcher it up and cook it for our family. Um, you know, because we still, we would gather um, pretty often all the time, and, you know, at that time, my grandmother would still cook out um, in an open fire under our traditional uh, chicky huts. And so that was like a great experience when I was growing up to learn these uh, different things and be able to be immersed in the culture in that way. Um, but it's still kind of up to me to learn further and to learn as much as I could. So the tree that I use the most for carving is cypress. It grows tall, relatively straight. So this makes it good for a lot of different purposes, such as dugout canoes, spoons, the frame for our chicky huts. And because of all those different characteristics, it really is a great choice for many different reasons. And cypress does have relatively smooth bark, and the wood is also relatively easy to work. For the thatching on our chicky huts, we use the sable palm. The sable palm leaf provides great waterproof coverage for our homes. So I started learning about wood carving when I was around 14 years old. I started learning from a gentleman named Ingram Billy Jr. And he took me out into the woods and showed me which trees to pick for which uh, objects because certain trees work better for spoons and certain trees work better for canoes and certain trees work better for uh, making our traditional stickball sticks. And so he taught me how to find those trees and how to pick the correct ones to make those objects. And uh, it was a really great time in my life and uh, I really learned a whole lot from him. Uh, again, not simply just about the objects or just trees, but just all that cultural knowledge I was able to absorb from him as well. Uh, my older brother as well um, is a wood carver, and so I learned quite a bit from him as well. And, you know, he had several teachers, um, you know, our different uncles and different elders within the tribe. And so with that, I was able to start my journey on wood carving. Um, now, everything I know today, I didn't necessarily learn from them because there's a lot of trial and error um, in the way I learned to do things. And so, you know, I kind of got the basics from them and then it's kind of, uh, you know, go out and try it on your own and, and see how much you can learn. And once you get to that point, you can go back and ask, you know, for more knowledge and uh, learn a little bit more and keep honing your skills over the years. And so that's what I've done. So I started as a teenager and, you know, even today I'm still trying to learn as much as I can about um, wood carving and my culture and my language and all the different things that are associated with it. These are what we call stickball sticks. In the southeast, it's a game that we play and it's played all along the east coast of the United States from here up into New York and even into Canada. And it's an important recreational game. Uh, it's also it can be an important important ceremonial game for our tribes as well. Um, so many people know the game of lacrosse. Um, it is related to stickball. Lacrosse does come from, the, from a version that's played up more around the Great Lakes um, and around New York and that area. In the southeast we tend to call it stickball. Um, some tribes use two sticks such as the Seminole tribe. Some will use just a single stick to play the game. So each tribe will have different ways that they play the game. Um, but they all do have the, the commonalities of having uh, one or two sticks, a ball, and some way to score in the game. But how each of those done, 
is done uh, varies from tribe to tribe. For the Seminole tribe, we use a single pole in the center of a circular field. And so both teams will try to score on that single pole. The way we play is uh, men against the women. And so that's the way we play for, for generations. And um, sometimes the men win, sometimes the women win. It's kind of 50-50 of who wins uh, the games and how many. And so we use the two sticks to grab and catch and throw the ball. So these are another type of stick ball stick that we use. They do look a whole lot like spoons. They are shaped a lot like spoons, um, but we use them for the game of stick ball as well. And so you can catch and throw with these also, just as well as the uh, other type. So this is an item that is really important to Southeastern native peoples. It is called a softki spoon. And what softki is, is just a soupy corn drink um, that is a main part of our diet. And so we grow lots of corn. There's still a few people that still grow our traditional corn. And, uh, you know, it's a really essential part to our culture. And so a long time ago, we didn't always have breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day when you had to grow your food, when you had to hunt and fish for it. And, uh, but we'd all, our grandmothers would always try and keep a pot of softki over the fire from that corn. And so if we were hungry, we could just go up and get one or two ladlefuls and drink what we needed to, to fill our tummies till our next full sit-down meal. And so again, as a, as a young Seminole man, it's important to learn how to make this object. And again, it's really important in all the different Southeastern native tribes to learn how to make a softki spoon. The last thing I want to talk about is a weapon. This is called a club. In our language, we call it yate stabliet, which literally just means people hitter. And so learning how to make uh, a weapon to be able to defend yourself was also important in different times. Uh, even up through the Seminole Wars in the 1800s, we were still making and using clubs, uh, even though we had access to, to modern black powder guns at that time. And so this was still an important uh, last resort weapon that we had and they do tend to be kind of this um, almost paddle shape uh, on these and so they're relatively light but still heavy enough to do their job. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the tools that I use for carving canoes. This is one of the main tools I use early on. This is called an axe. It is really great for shaping outside shapes, moving a lot of wood quickly. It's got a very, you know, heavy weight to it, so it swings really hard and, and can remove in, inside and outside of the canoe. Um, not necessarily great for fine carving, so it's really good for heavy, rough carving on the canoe. Another great tool that I have is this curved ADZE. A-D-Z-E is how you spell that. And so this is also great for removing a lot of wood, just like the axe does. Uh, the only difference is this fits really nicely inside the curved shapes of a canoe. And so because it's uh, a little bit of a longer size, it's uh, good at removing those large amounts of wood. Um, but it is small enough that I can do some slightly finer carving with this tool as well. So this tool that I have here, this is a one-handed adze. So it has a shorter handle on it, but it's really great for swinging with a single hand. And so this is really great for that finer carving, um, both on the inside and outside of the canoe. Anywhere where there's some nice curves and shapes that you need to fit into. So as you can see, the top of the ads here has that nice curve, that nice sweep to it. So when you swing it, it'll fit inside all those areas. And so this is a really great tool. Um, I really do love using this one a lot. And uh, it's great for getting me uh, close to finishing the canoes. So once I've done most of the shaping on the canoe with the axe and the different adzes, one of the last tools that I use is called a scorp. And so you can see that circular shape there, and this has a sharp edge on this side here, right there. So you can pull it through the canoe, and it'll take out nice shavings and make it very smooth and even on the inside of that canoe. So it'll take up um, 
all those rough chop marks that might be left inside the canoe from the other tools. The tool I have right here is called a hand plane and it's really just a great tool to use. It's used for smoothing long flat surfaces and so for me that's the outsides of the canoe and a few parts on the inside of the canoe. It doesn't really work very well where there's any curves because it has this nice long flat bed here. It has a blade right there and a small opening so that when you take off those very thin shavings it has somewhere to go and it leaves a very smooth surface on the canoe. So there's several tools that I use for carving smaller objects such as this model canoe or little alligators soft key spoons and those types of things. And so this is a carving hatchet. And so it's really great, it has this nice long edge so you get a nice long chopping motion. You can do some slicing and planing with it. It's got this cutout here and so that allows you to choke up on the ax to do more detailed cuts. So after I've gone through and used the hatchet and roughed out whatever item I'm making, I'll go and use my carving knife. So it has this long slightly sweeping edge to do carving it's very sharp and there's several cuts that you can use for for doing these carving and to finish out the different shapes and so sometimes i am pulling the knife towards me to make cuts sometimes i'm cutting across like this kind of a scissor motion um, so there's different things that you learn for carving that make it much easier to use a uh, knife in hand carving. So the last tool that I use, if needed, is this hook knife. And you can see it has that curved hook edge to it. And so this is really great if you have inside curved shapes like the inside of this canoe. You can make nice long shavings on the inside. It also works on things like soft key spoons and bowls and those types of things. And so it's a really important tool and a really handy tool for doing these inside shapes where a straight knife wouldn't work. So I really hope you learned something today about Seminole carving, our history, our culture. And I'd really like you to know that Seminoles still practice our culture, our language, um, our traditional religion. And these are really important to who we are and in the greater context of who we are in this modern world and where we're going in the future.